On this day, in 1918, the guns fell silent across the lines. After four years of the most ferocious conflict ever known, peace had finally been achieved between the warring powers. Fighting still continued. Across the former Russian Empire, a catastrophic civil war had been unleashed as the Germans had introduced the contagion of revolution into the autocratic state. Whilst in Africa, the news of German surrender was not to reach their forces there for a further two weeks. The fighting in the Middle East would die down, but would soon erupt once more. And yet, for all that the world's ills were far from solved, for at least this moment the soldiers of the battered empires could lay down their arms and breathe a little more easily. They had survived. The Allies of the Entente stood bloody but victorious. They had defeated perhaps the most militarised state in the world, one founded in blood and iron with aspirations of global domination. It is easily forgotten today, with the benefit of hindsight, that the Kaiser's Germany was as much of a danger to the integrity of Europe as his successor dictator would be. The Germany of 1914 was already a well-practised war machine and had achieved its very existence as a state through the policy of conquest and subjugation of its neighbours, both militarily and diplomatically. Kaiser Wilhelm II abandoned the nuanced diplomacy of his father and Bismarck and pursued a continued policy of aggravation and threat across Europe, culminating in the seizure of several colonies and the creation of a huge war fleet, Unnecessary for German security, but a direct threat to the British Empire. The causes of the war are manifold. German fear of Franco-Russian encirclement, the instability of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and desire for control over the ailing Ottoman Empire, to name but a few. But the upheaval of the unification of Germany, a new and ambitious state led not by democracy, but the iron fist of military aristocracy, was seemingly destined to end in war. The eventual Entente victory, achieved at such a price, should have heralded a new age. It was intended that the colossal blood sacrifice of the war should have achieved an epoch of talk and understanding between nations, where the strong would protect the weak and armed conflict would be averted, but the peace was lost. Conflicting priorities and promises between the Allies saw the greatest of diplomatic disasters unfold in agonising slow motion. Compromise. Germany was treated neither with utter harshness nor comparative leniency, and loopholes in the Versailles Treaty restrictions were soon identified. Despite losing 10% of its territory, Germany remained the largest and richest Central European nation. The lack of stomach in the Allied nations for further conflict would also see a reluctance to reimpose restrictions, allowing Germany to rebuild itself through the 1930s. New nations had been founded in the peace process without a regard to the cultural backgrounds of their inhabitants, causing many conflicts which endure to this day, whilst the new democratic German state which was created lacked any legitimacy in the eyes of its people. The first pretenses of non-military rule had in fact only been implemented during the war to enable negotiations with the Allies, whilst the Kaiser, cornerstone of German society, had been removed when the new state was imposed. A constitutional monarchy, such as in Britain or Italy, may have been able to add the weight of the monarch's character to increase legitimacy for the fledgling Weimar Republic but Franco-American opposition to monarchs was to prevent this support from being added. The German state had been founded as an absolutist one, and to absolutism it would soon return. Ethnic tensions within the Austro-Hungarian Empire had precipitated its collapse during the war, but the new states that were founded in the aftermath were far from cooperative, and the Balkan region was to remain a hotbed of tension for many years to come, joined by the new protectorates in the Middle East, which the Allies were to carve out with an arbitrariness that seems with hindsight to have been designed to cause the maximum level of tensions in the region. The greatest disaster to befall the peace process came from the United States. The foundation of the League of Nations carried the greatest promise for the future of diplomatic resolution to issues, in which nations could consult as equals and agree to set aside their differences. Yet the USA whose idea the institution had been, refused to join. Washing their hands of involvement in world affairs, the United States returned to a policy of isolationism, 
her position now greatly enhanced by the monies of the old world taken in loans and payments for manufactured goods and armaments ensuring that when future global issues arose, the largest democracy and industrial power on the planet would turn her back. The ominous portents for the future, with the notable exception of Ferdinand Foch's dour pronouncement that Versailles was not peace but an armistice for twenty years, were for the most part as yet unseen. The Great War was only to be seen as folly once the storm clouds of World War II were to gather, and at the time of peace it was seen as both necessary and, for the Entente, a victory well worth celebrating. The order of democratic empires had been preserved in the face of absolutism. The collapse of Tsarism in Russia was widely seen as an inevitability, and the removal of the despot had aided in justifying American involvement. Whilst the war had been a deeply traumatic experience, it had also been an adventure for many ordinary men who, without conscription, would have been unlikely to ever travel beyond the confines of their county. To see France, Belgium, Egypt and more was a life-changing experience, and the feelings of camaraderie and shared experience was to give many a new sense of self-worth that was to inform the entire rest of their lives. In Britain in particular there was a palpable sense of promised social change that would change the country. A new equality had been earned on the battlefield. It would take several years from the armistice for the enormity of the war's consequences upon the world to become truly clear. Many analyses of the Great War falsely describe it as a colossal affair of misery and futility. The misery is undeniable, but the shared experience was indeed for many the most defining moment of their life and the futility of the struggle is a misidentification, only perceptible knowing all that was to follow. The war effectively ended the spectre of absolute monarchy that Europe had spent centuries first developing and then overthrowing, and also began the advancement of new ways of life and war in which the people were truly empowered. Within Britain, much commemoration of the Great War focuses upon the unpleasantness of existence as a soldier on the Western Front. Yet the endless poetry obscures the average life. Most British soldiers were not unwilling pacifists. They were ordinary men initially signing up through patriotism, romanticism, or indeed seeing a simple means of making something greater of their lives. Most later conscripts accepted the call willingly and were still keen to do their bit. They suffered together with their friends and largely made do without recourse to despair. The Wipers Times provides a useful snapshot of the average soldier's approach to life, in the following poem. Three Tommies sat in the trench one day, discussing the war in the normal way. They talked of the mud, and they talked of the hun, of what was to do and what had to be done. They talked about rum. But the point which they argued from post back to pillar was whether Notts County could beat Aston Villa. Whilst many amongst the French and Russian armies turned to radical politics, and the ethnic tensions of the Austro-Hungarians were vastly exacerbated by the war, the average British soldier put up with his lot with remarkable stoicism. The unpleasantness of trench existence was met with a resigned good humour which, though often cutting, was never a call to rise up. The organisational structure of the British army also developed to deal remarkably well with maintaining morale rotating troops out of the line with some alacrity, ensuring regular post and leave, and working to foster the camaraderie of the troops of all ranks. With the exception of some Dominion forces, it is telling that the British were the only major power within the war not to face a mutiny within their regular army. For all that the revisionist may argue that common perceptions of the war are flawed, however, one cannot dismiss the utter, grinding atrocity of the conflict. Fighting over much of the same ground for over four years saw men literally living and dying amongst the remains of fallen comrades. The capacity of modern weapons to kill and maim was shocking to behold, though not unprecedented as the American Civil War and Russo-Japanese Wars had shown. The roughly 20 million men who died, and further 20 million to be wounded, tore huge wounds open in societies across the globe, the collective mental scarring is impossible to quantify, but there is no denying that the impact of the Great War is still felt across Europe, and indeed the world, today. Much of the remembrance of the Great War still focuses on the trenches in France and Belgium, and the churning attrition of soldiers there. 
But it should not be forgotten that this was a truly world war. In Europe alone, fighting raged across the Alps, the Balkan states, Greece, and the great open spaces of Russia. In the Middle East, tanks and trains pursued camels and horses through the deserts, whilst daring forces in the vastness of Africa carried out lightning campaigns. The Japanese were active, fighting alongside Australians and New Zealanders in the Far East, and naval actions crisscrossed the globe, from South America and the Falkland Islands to the Indian Ocean, the Baltic and the Black Sea. Each front has its own unpleasant uniqueness. The flies and thirst of the Palestine front, the deadly splinters of rock torn from the mountains by every shell on the Alps, the huge distances and lack of supplies on the Russian front, and the infamous mud of the French and Belgian. The war touched every corner of the globe. Ultimately, 32 of the 55 independent nation-states in existence at that time were direct participants, with each of the major powers also drawing on a vast number of colonies, dependencies and other overseas possessions. It is telling that the war is not remembered in many nations, which only gained their independence after the end of the conflict, despite the large numbers of participants from their now present states. Many volunteers from neutral nations were to join the fight throughout the war, enlisting either through belief in the cause or a sense of adventure, ensuring that the roles of losses recorded are perhaps the most globally representative ever seen in a war up until that point. This was also the first war to see significant combat in three dimensions, on land, above and below the waves, and in the skies. Submarines, tanks and aircraft were to evolve from mere curiosities to deadly tools of absolute necessity to the modern commander. Sinking shipping without warning, crushing obstacles and raining fire from above. The Battle of the Atlantic in the next chapter of the World Wars is well remembered in Britain today, but the starvation blockade of the Great War was also to prove the greatest threat to British survival of the entire conflict. London also faced bombing from the air, first from airships and then dedicated bombers, and the Allies were to respond in kind, extending the war to the home front through new means. The technical and tactical advances of the war have in many ways served as the blueprint for all future conflicts, as multiple revolutions in military affairs saw every major power learning together how to utilise the weaponry that had appeared. The British example saw a tiny regular army, operating under Victorian leadership and tactics, transformed into a multi-million man citizen army drawn from across the empire, equipped with technologies hitherto barely comprehended, and which was arguably the most capable fighting force on earth in the space of a mere four years. The greatest of flawed perceptions of the war, and still regrettably the most common, is that somehow neither combatant learned that four years were spent hurling men against trenches and that the central powers simply gave up in the end. The reality was unbelievably more complex. After the initial German successes, the combatants on all fronts faced combat conditions that had in fact been foreseen by many, and a complex process of development occurred on all sides, as new weapons and tactics were tested in constant contact with the enemy. Each new development was in turn countered by the enemy, and the race was not to find a war-winning weapon, but a whole system of fighting that was to overcome the obstacles of modern war. The trenches themselves became so widespread in order to keep men alive in the face of the power of modern weapons, and their efficacy was only truly appreciated as losses began to mount again in the restored campaigns of movement in 1918. It was the Allies who were to succeed in developing a truly unified doctrine of war, repulsing the final colossal German spring offensive and counter-attacking along their lines in a decisive war of movement with tanks, aircraft and artillery all working in unison to finally drive the Germans out of their conquered lands. The advance was not restricted to the Western Front either. Allied breakthroughs had also occurred in the Middle East, Alpine regions and the Balkans, where the Bulgarian army was driven from arguably the most powerful system of defences in the entire war. Unprecedented numbers of prisoners were captured in the last months, as the Central Powers finally disintegrated. It was the mass surrender of German troops on the 8th of August which had led to the day being infamously branded the Black Day of the German Army. The Allied armies of 1918 had advanced to a breathtaking degree and managed not only to launch the first war of offensive movement that they had achieved during the entire war, but to carry it on to victory. 
Backed by an overwhelming industrial and population base, the Allies had by late 1918 developed a form of combined arms warfare that still forms the effective basis for modern armed forces. A general of 1918 could, with a short introduction, understand a modern battlefield. A general of 1914 would have struggled in 1918. By the time of the Hundred Days, the Allied armies were led by commanders who had learned the lessons of the horrifying early failures and were now ready to lead their men on to victory. Haig, Monash, Curry, Foch and Petain were just some of those whose ideas on combat had evolved as rapidly as the tactics. The myth of Chateau Generalship is perhaps the greatest and most callous lie of the war. It is widely believed that the average soldier was sent to his death by incompetent upper-class officers with no comprehension of the state of the front line. Modern war had made it essential for a general to be at headquarters, where he could direct the enormous forces under his command more effectively. Yet 78 British generals alone were still killed during the war, and more than a 100 were captured or wounded. Haig was actually compelled to order his senior officers away from the front line, as so many were being killed leading their men. Ratios of death from Oxbridge colleges was twice the national average, and there were higher fatalities amongst ducal families than during 1330 to 1479, the period of the Hundred Years' War and the Wars of the Roses. 17% of officers in the British Army were killed, compared to 12% of men. Among the French too, there was a great expectation for officers to lead from the front, leading to horrifying casualties from amongst their ranks. This was the last war in which many political leaders involved in its conduct were to lose sons. Herbert Asquith lost a son and Bonner Law lost two, as did over a hundred noble families. Twenty-three British MPs were killed, along with twenty-four peers of the realm. Theodore Roosevelt was reportedly never the same after his son was killed. Many of the future leaders of Europe were deeply affected by their having fought in the war, or the family they lost. Future Allied generals were often affected by a deep aversion to sending their men to die, and the appeasement policies of the 1930s were a natural response to those who believed they had the chance to prevent the horrors of war from striking another generation. The Great War served to be a great leveller of British society. The rights of workers were increased, whilst increased taxation and a loss of sons saw hundreds of stately homes, the bedrock of British country life, abandoned as the fortunes of their families dwindled away. With historical hindsight, the Great War might best be described as a systematic effort by Europe to annihilate its own culture and way of life. In the aftermath, the weakened and bankrupt powers of both sides faced years of disunity and turmoil as faith in their states was shaken and authority undermined. The rise of communism in Russia was to be the catalyst for widespread violence and unrest for at least the next century whilst the upheavals within the states of victors and vanquished alike would prove fertile ground for the rise of other extremist ideologies in the coming decades. The only real victors were Imperial Japan and the United States. Japan had expanded her empire for virtually no loss, whilst the United States had effectively bought the victorious powers through loans and aid, and also seen an industrial boom as that lent money was reinvested into American factories. The empires of the vanquished were lost, whilst those of the victors could not be adequately policed or maintained. Virtually every family in Europe had suffered a loss, and old virtues of valour and sacrifice had been tainted. Genocide had been promulgated in the Ottoman Empire, and ethnic tensions which had long simmered had seen a violent re-emergence across the continent that was only to intensify in the coming years. Yet was there an alternative? Could another path have been sought to avoid this catastrophe? It is hard to imagine one. The Kaiser's ambitions were clear. Had the life of Franz Ferdinand been spared, it is doubtful the Germans would not have found another pretense to lash out at the encroaching influence of France and Russia. Could Britain have avoided an involvement? It is doubtful. A German hegemony on the continent would have been too menacing to avoid, and whilst one may identify key decision points in which the direction of the war might have changed and countless lives been spared, war itself was an inevitability. The unfettered ambition of Wilhelm II had, by 1914, so poisoned European affairs that the prospect of a great power war was a matter of when, and not if. The Pax Britannica had been undermined, and over two centuries of European ascendancy would be brought to an apocalyptic end.
After reviewing this video, I thought it wise to speak a little more directly. It's probably clear from the lack of focus that my feelings on the Great War are conflicting. As a historian, I am something of a revisionist, and I do feel that much of what is currently taught of the war paints an inaccurate picture. However, I cannot discount the horrifying human and societal impact of this cataclysmic event. The millions of lives cut abruptly short or permanently scarred, the years of unrest and the torment and division still living on today. My own family was deeply affected by the war, as was effectively every other family across the country and the continent. The Anglo-centricism of my study stems both from my personal reading on the subject and the fact that in everyday life I am surrounded by the reminders of the world wars, the stark memorials, the ruined and abandoned buildings, and indeed the very spirit of the nation I call home. I hope you'll forgive the emotiveness of this video, but despite not having lived through the war myself, I am still surrounded by its consequences and cannot help but be moved.